The final goal of studying fluid dynamics is to understand the flow field and translate these learnings into developing engineering applications or products. For example, we study fluid dynamics to understand the behavior of flow field around an aircraft. This provides insightful information on how its design should be modified to generate a larger force for the aircraft to fly. This force is called lift force. Similarly, we understand flow around an impeller in a mixing tank so we can get more uniform mixing. A good understanding of flow variables such as velocity, pressure, density and temperature in the flow field helps engineers make products better. The need for understanding these flow fields brings us to the mathematical description of fluid motion. Here we use mathematics as a tool to describe the flow field in both time and space. To do this we invoke the continuum assumption using which we treat flow variables such as velocity, pressure, temperature and density as continuous functions in time and space. Before describing the governing equations of fluid motion and different ways of solving them, we will first venture into the topic of fluid kinematics. Fluid kinematics does not consider forces acting on the body. It only examines the motion of the fluid. The parameters of interest here are position, velocity and acceleration. Let us first start with the velocity field. Fluid velocity is a vector quantity, which means it has both magnitude as well as direction. It can be described in the form of three components in the Cartesian coordinates. Fluid velocity can be a function of both space and time. Knowledge of this variable at each point in the space helps us describe the bulk motion of the fluid. We visualize each fluid particle as a fluid element in the flow field. One or more things can happen to this fluid element. This element can undergo translation or rotation or angular deformation or volumetric deformation. In this lesson, we will discuss each of these components in detail. Translation of a fluid element involves linearly displacing this element from one point to another. In pure translation, the shape of the fluid element does not change. It merely moves from one location to another. When a fluid element undergoes pure rotation, it is rotating about its respective element axis. This rotation is given by a physical quantity called angular velocity. We take a regular 3D element aligned along the xy plane with dimensions delta x and delta y. The velocity components at each point are given by u and v. If we take u and v to be the velocity components at point O, then the x-velocity and y-velocity components at P can be obtained using Taylor series. We can similarly obtain the velocity components at other points Q and R. The rate of deformation for d theta 1 can be expressed by the following limit. Since d theta 1 is small, this ratio can further be simplified in terms of the net displacement of point P to P prime over delta x. As displacement occurs from P to P prime over a small time dt, we can write this displacement P P prime using the P component of velocity. When we replace P P prime, we obtain the final value of deformation per unit time for d theta 1. In a similar manner, displacement qq prime can be written for small time dt. 
Following a similar approach, we can arrive at deformation per unit time for d theta 2. The overall angular velocity about the z axis is defined as the average angular velocity of these deformations per unit time. Other components of angular velocity can also be defined in the same manner. In fluid dynamics, vorticity is defined as the measure of rotation of a fluid element and mathematically it is equal to twice the angular velocity or rotational speed of that element. A more detailed discussion on vorticity and vortex flows is presented in the next lesson. Angular deformation is the third type of fluid motion and can be described as changing the angle between two mutually perpendicular segments of the fluid element. For the fluid element shown, it is defined as the rate at which the angle between line segments OP prime and OQ prime decreases. Over a time period delta T, the change in this angle due to angular deformation is because of rate of shearing strain. This expression is only applicable in the xy plane. We can similarly define other components. Together these six components are called symmetric rate of shearing strain or rate of angular deformation. The last and the final type of fluid motion commonly found in fluid elements is volumetric deformation. The shape of a fluid element is defined by the angle between its line segments. During volumetric deformation, this angle remains constant. This retains the original shape of the element. However, the length of the element in x and y directions change. To change the length of the fluid element in the x direction, it will require a non-zero value of u-velocity gradient along the x direction. Similarly, change in length in the y direction will require dv over dy to be non-zero. This analysis can be extended to the z direction as well. These individual terms are called components of longitudinal strain in x, y and z directions respectively. The total rate of volumetric strain is given by the following equation. The angular and volumetric strains together form the overall strain tensor. The off-diagonal terms of this tensor describe the angular deformation whereas the main diagonal terms represent volumetric deformation. Until now, we have learnt about the velocity vector and different types of motion undergone by a fluid element. Let us now switch gears and look at tools to visualize the flow field. At any given instant in time, we can draw lines in the flow field such that they are tangential to the local direction of flow at every point. In other words, these lines are tangential to the local velocity vectors in the flow field. These lines are called streamlines. In case of steady flows, velocity is not a function of time and remains only a function of space. Therefore, the streamlines do not change in time. If we define an imaginary particle on a streamline in steady flows, it will remain on this streamline as if it were riding along. In addition to streamlines, we also use path lines and streak lines to describe the motion of a fluid. A path line is the line traced out by the trajectory of a moving particle as it flows in the flow field. To define a streak line, we have to focus our attention to a particular region in the fluid flow. If we release fluid particles at this exact location in the flow field, the line connecting all individual particles crossing this unique location will form a streak line. In most experiments, we use 
colored dyes to visualize the flow field. Such dyes are released at one particular location in the flow field. After a considerable amount of time, the dye streak represents a streak line. It is important to understand that for steady flows, the streamlines, path lines and streak lines can all be represented by one single line. In the next lesson, we will learn more about these lines and how to visualize them. But before we get there, let us wrap up by talking about two different types of mathematical descriptions to understand the flow field. The first one is the Lagrangian description of the flow field. In this description, the fluid is assumed to be a collection of large number of fluid parcels. The idea of Lagrangian description is to follow these individual fluid parcels through the flow field. In fact, the motion of these fluid parcels is described as a function of time. This helps the analyst estimate the position, velocity and acceleration of each fluid parcel in time. The second type of mathematical description is the Eulerian description. In this, we focus on a particular region in space rather than on individual fluid particles. These regions in space are commonly referred to as control volumes and its boundaries are referred to as control surfaces. Fluid is viewed as it enters and exits these control surfaces. Flow parameters and fluid properties are described to be a function of both time and space. Naturally, the next question would be, is one description better than the other? The answer is no. We can pretty much use either of the two formulations to describe the fluid flow. We can derive the fluid equations using either of the two formulations and if solved correctly, both formulations give the exact same solution. 